Hi, and welcome to chapter 18, Portfolio Performance and Evaluation. So in this chapter, we're going to look at how you measure your portfolio's overall performance and some concepts of portfolio construction. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of math in this chapter. Some of it's simple, some of it complex. I don't want anybody to get too overly concerned about the math in this chapter because it's not going to be on the final. So there's nothing mathematical from this chapter that you have to worry about calculating for the final. But some of the concepts in this chapter uh, you should know and are going to be very helpful in understanding what you're going to be putting together at the end of this course. So with that in mind, let's um, tackle this chapter. So now, there can be, here's some th three objectives of management style. One could be a passive management where you're building a diversified portfolio. Um, say a class of passive management style may be to build a portfolio identical to the S&P 500 and just maintain the um, your mutual fund to be identical to the S&P 500. So you don't do anything unless the S&P 500 drops a stock and adds a stock. So it's a very passive strategy. So there's no real um, management evaluating the pricing of stocks. There's no, you're not looking for any mispriced stocks to buy it at a, at a discount to try to make some profit on. So this is, this management style is actually quite popular because it winds up beating active management styles more often than not. And it has a much lower expense ratio. Now, an active management style would be trying to forecast where stock prices are going, looking at the broad markets, identifying stocks that are undervalued, and you're trying to achieve higher returns than the overall market or a passive strategy. So active management can be successful for certain very talented mutual fund managers who have a knack for or a skill for uh, picking the right stocks at the right time, sort of like a Warren Buffett or a Peter Lynch uh, type of person who are going to outperform the market. But this active management requires a lot of additional labor, a lot of additional work, uh, a lot of additional analysts, so the expense ratios are higher. Now, there's also market timing, which is trying to see the the market as it moves up and down from bull, ma bull market to bear market and trying to drive performance based on uh, moving in and out of the stock market based on the ups and downs of the stock market. So if we think the stock market's going to crash, we move everything into cash. And then when the stock market is at the bottom, there's capitulation, we move our money back into the stock market to try to get the next bull market. So market timing is another type of activity. Okay. Now, now, let's look at this comparative universe here. So there's a set of portfolio managers with similar investment styles. Um, let's assess uh, the relative performance. So if we look at, this is going to be, the, the, the blue square will be the S&P 500, and the red, I'm sorry, the black diamond will be this other group, which we'll think of as a, um, a, mutual, a mutual fund investment group, active management perhaps. So you can see here that in the first quarter uh, that the beat, this would be the rate of return. So the active management in this style beat the S&P 500 compared to the full year, it didn't, it underperformed the S&P 500. Over three years, it underperformed the S&P 500, and over five years, it underperformed the S&P 500. So this is pretty typical of an active management group where, oh, similar. If you're looking to see performance, but this could also be, maybe this is going to be, the investment style is going to be passive. So here in this, we would see that the passive active style is relatively a failure, not coming close to the S&P 500. So I would say that the investment style here must be more of an active management, giving the variation of return in, in some of the years. Now you would expect to see that if our portfolio had a management style 
that was going to be passive close to the S&P 500, that your portfolio would perform close to the S&P 500, but a little bit below because of the expense ratios um, and the commissions and fees involved in managing uh, a stock portfolio that's trying to mimic the S&P 500. So we always want to kind of compare performance to a baseline or a benchmark for evaluation. Okay. Now also, mathematically, if we want to look at performance, we can do an arithmetic average. And this is the easiest. It's just really a, a mean. It's the sum of returns in each period divided by the number of periods. So if we had five years and we take the return for each year for five years and just divide, add them up and divide by five, a very simple average of return. But this is not really the best measure of how your money grows. A geometric average would be a better uh, measure of the actual cumulative performance of your return. And so a geometric average would be more accurate to how your money is growing over time from period to period. And we're looking at the compounding period by period of the return. So a geometric average is better for evaluating um, market returns than say an arithmetic average. Now the dollar weighted average return is more of a, uh, an IRR, internal rate of return on an investment. So what we're looking here is the initial investment. And then when that investment generates any dividends or um, it's reinvested, or if new capital goes in, it's reinvested. Uh, and we're looking at buying the stock what we call dollar weighted, meaning that if we have invest $1,000 every month, we're gonna get a different share price every some month the share prices will be higher some month the share prices will be lower but we're dollar weighted average so that way we don't have to worry about putting all our money in the beginning of the market at a very high level then the market goes down we have an opportunity to buy at all points in the market when market or shares are going up or where shares are going down so eventually we get an average purchase price for the stock we're trying to accumulate so this is really usually pretty typical investment advice a dollar cost to average don't put all your money into the market the same exact time just in case it happens to be a high point of the market so dollar cost averaging is a much easier method for building a portfolio okay so risk adjusted performance this is a mathematical you know a single index model that can be used to measure some abnormal performance um, compared to normal performance so it's really looking at expected returns and beta uh, so this is a formula that we can measure our portfolio against, say, the market. Now, the, the variance of the market-driven return component can be broken out in this formula and, um, and the variance return on P, the price. So this is another risk um, or performance, another risk-adjusted uh, measure, mathematical measure. Now, the Sharpe ratio, uh, we talked about Sharpe and some of his ideas in, the pre in previous chapters or um, we're going to in chapters coming up, um, the reward to volatility ratio is what we call it. So excess returns to the standard deviation. So this is something where um, trying to look at the portfolio as far as um, what are the returns of the portfolio compared to the standard deviation to get a more of a, a measure of volatility. The M2 is a um, return difference between a managed portfolio and a leveraged to match the volatility of passive index and return on that index. So again, you can look to the textbook chapter, which will kind of break out this formula a little bit more, but just another mathematical formula to help evaluate performances of portfolios. And again, things like this, which I kind of reinforced throughout the whole uh, textbook here is that it's not easy to do or demonstrate these mathematical models in PowerPoint. I usually like to use Excel to uh, talk about and demonstrate some of these models. Okay, so here is, let's do this example. So suppose instead of investing all its funds in P, the endowment had invested only 76.76 uh, of its funds with the remainder placed in a risk-free asset. So then we can kind of input those numbers. So if you look here in the formula, we can see uh, where we're going to replace those numbers within the formula uh, to get that M2. Okay, and then interpretation of this, 
um, would be what is the difference of, you know, uh, um, putting in, you know, the remainder in risk-free assets. You know, so if we look at, you know, plotting that on a scale of, you know, average excess return versus a standard deviation, we can see that if we have the M2 for Cal P and Cal M plotted, we can kind of get an idea of how that uh, return differential will extrapolate um, over different standard deviations. Okay, um, now if we're going to talk about the um, trainer measure, this is another ratio of portfolio excessive returns to beta. Pretty simple though, it's, you know, uh, we're going to evaluate our portfolio and, you know, so it's not a very complex calculation, but it's something that uh, is useful. So this measure was developed by Jack um, Trainer, and so he developed a portfolio measure that, you know, the performance measures similar to the Sharpe ratio. So it's not that different than the Sharpe ratio, but Trainer's measure uses the portfolio beta to measure the portfolio risk. So again, we're using, you know, we can calculate the beta for a portfolio, and then we can use that to help hopefully um, focus only on the non-diversifiable risk, assuming that the portfolio has been built to eliminate all the diversifiable risk, meaning that basically, you know, it's not a portfolio of only semiconductor companies. It's a portfolio that's diversified among many different industries. You know, in, in one sense, it's the total portfolio return minus the risk-free rate, which would be the variable here at the top, and we're going to divide by the portfolio beta here at the bottom. So this measure gives the uh, risk premium per unit of non-diversifiable risk, which is measured by the portfolio beta. So using, you know, using the data here, if we look at the example, we're assuming that the beta for this portfolio is, for T to the P is the first example here I'm looking at. The beta is 1.25. 1 uh, now in the second T to the Q, the beta is 0.5. Uh, so if we divide by this top number here, which I, which is the portfolio total portfolio turn, return, my, of course minus the risk free rate, we get the measure. So you could see that e, uh, with a lower beta, we can still get a higher measure of this. And so what is this this output basically saying? So uh, like the sharp measure, uh, it's useful you know to, to compare either to each other the portfolios you know, to the market. So basically the beta is the comparison to the market. So generally the higher the value of this measure, the better. So the greater the risk premium per unit of non-diversifiable risk is what it's expressing. So assuming that the market return, um, we can recognize the overall effect. So even though we have a higher return here in the portfolio, if the beta is higher for the portfolio, it's gonna lower the um, the trainer measure. So it's gonna mean, mean that this is riskier. So the higher the measure is also gonna look at the well more well-managed the risk is for the particular um, portfolio or you know the ratio of excessive return to beta. Uh, okay. So it's a very, very typical measure that you'll see if you look at any um, prospectus on a mutual fund, they usually will have this measure in the mutual fund. Now, there's this information ratio, which is going to be a ratio of beta to the standard deviation. So again, we're going to have, I'm sorry, it's a ratio of alpha to the standard deviation. And you see here, this is the alpha to the standard deviation. So the sharp ratio of optimizing portfolio would then be expressed as, as a square root um, of this measure incorporated. So the, you know, the information ratio, just give you a little background on that. It's basically, it's going to call for another performance criteria. So we're going to consider, you know, any type of fund with a large, passive, well-diversified position, you know, so that portfolio is going to resemble, a, you know, an index, indexed equity fund. So now the fund, you know, decides to add a position in an active portfolio to the current position. For example, um, it might be uh, having, you know, a percentage of passive management than a percentage of active management uh, to its core position, 
And so more traditional portfolios will be established with uh, concerns over diversification in mind. So what this equation down here, we're looking at what this basically is telling us is the you know, appropriate performance measure uh, for a fund you know, is going to be uh, in this information ratio. So if you're looking for active management or active managers to add to the currently index position, you'll want to select you know, potential candidates with the best information ratios. So the information ratio is yet another version of the risk to reward type of ratio. So in the context, the reward is the alpha of the active position. So it is expected, you know, return on that incremental portfolio over and above the risk premium that normally would be uh, corresponding to the systematic risk. So on the other hand, the incremental position tilts to the total risky portfolio away from the passive index and therefore exposes it to risks that could be, in principle, diversified. So the information ratio um, quantifies the trade-off between alpha and diversified risk. Um, so again, this ratio isn't as common, but it's just another ratio of um, a portfolio analysis. Okay, so here are a couple of examples, have portfolio P and portfolio Q. So we could see if we look at these two portfolios and we put the numbers in the portfolio, we could see um, the output. And you know, and basically, um, we want we want to know uh, the riskiness here uh, as far as compared to the diversification. So the higher this multiple, the riskier performance. Okay. All right, so let's look at these performance measures again. We have um, the sharp, which is excessive return or excess return over standard deviation. So the application is we use this when choosing among portfolios, um, competing for overall uh, for the overall risky portfolio. Now the trainer, which we just the excess return over the beta, when ranking many portfolios that may be mixed to the form of the overall riskiness of the uh, portfolio. And then the information ratio, which I just talked about, is gonna be evaluating portfolio to be mixed with a benchmark portfolio. So these are just different measures in different contexts of risk and what we're trying to, to measure against. And again, you know, these are nothing that you should worry about as far as calculating the math on them. It's more just how you would estimate the return, the performance of these funds related to what type of uh, position and marketing systematic or non-systematic risk that they might have. Okay, so let's move over to the Jensen's measure, sometimes called the Jensen's alpha. So Michael uh, Jensen developed a portfolio performance measure that seems quite different from the measures we were just talking about, the sharp and the trainer measures. Yet theoretically consistent with the trainer's measure, the Jensen's measure, um, sometimes referred to as the Jensen's alpha, because alpha is a, a big component of this measurement. You know, it's based on the capital asset pricing model that we talked about in another chapter, and it calculates the portfolio's excess return or abnormal return. So the excess return is the amount by which the portfolio's actual return deviates from its required or expected return, which is determined by using its beta and, and with its, which is part of the capital asset pricing model. So the value of the excess return may be um, positive, zero, or negative. So like the trainer measure, the Jensen measure focuses only on the non-diversifiable risk, and assuming that the portfolio is adequately already diversified um, which is going to remove the diversifiable risk. So this is only really focusing on the non-diversifiable risk. So the Jensen measure, you know, the way it would be calculated, we'd look at the total portfolio return measured here, minus the risk-free rate, uh, minus the uh, beta, the portfolio beta, times the market return, which is, of course, so here we're going to have the portfolio return, but we subtract the, the risk free rate out of it. And back here on the market return, we also subtract out the risk free rate. So in this equation, the risk free rate is canceled out. So it's really just 
um, the remaining portfolio return after we subtract the risk-free rate, and then we subtract that from the, um, the beta multiplied by the remaining market return after we subtract that the risk-free rate. And so the Jensen's measure is going to indicate the difference between the portfolio's actual return and its required return. So positive values indicate that there's going to be superior performance uh, above the positive return. So it indicates that the portfolio earned a return in excess of the risk-adjusted required return. A value zero indicates the portfolio exactly uh, returned is, it, uh, is equal to its required return. And a negative value would indicate the portfolio failed in its required return. So again, a positive number would be we're looking at abnormal returns above the you know required return and negative would be returns below the required return. Um, so it's, an, it's important because we get an idea, again, it's a measure of performance for the portfolio. Okay, so now we could look at the alpha capture and transport. These are basically alpha transport is establishing an alpha while using index products uh, to both hedge the market exposure and establish risk to desired sectors. So it's really sort of um, moving the alpha by using some sort of hedging, um, like a futures contract or options contract to kind of reduce the exposure of certain markets or increase the exposure um, of certain desired markets. And the alpha capture is a construction of a positive alpha portfolio with systematic risk hedged away. So we wanna basically look at take the alpha and use other financial constructs constructs to modify, say, the stock portfolios to take away some of these riskier elements. But in doing so, extra fees and commissions have to be paid to set up these alternate positions, sort of marrying together the portfolio. So maybe you have an S&P 500 portfolio and you're worried about a market crash. Or you can transport or capture some of the alpha by making a hedging strategy maybe with a futures contract so that way if the market does go down um, or more more so actually an option contract if the market does go down the option contract will, will replace the losses related to alpha based on the market abnormal change in the market but it's going to come at a cost of premium to that option contract so it's something that more sophisticated uh, hedge funds can do to manage their portfolios and try to mitigate risk Okay. Now here is here is some of the mathematical you know examples of that. Uh, again, a little hard to explain over PowerPoint. Okay. So if we're going to use a multi a multi index model, uh, so this again is another model where we can you know estimate alpha using you know multi index models, which is a you know, pretty advanced subject. Not something that you would ever be tested on in this course, but something that you may want to read about um, the mathematics of it a little bit more closer. But again, what we're just trying to do here is um, capture multiple valuation points to get a better estimation of alpha. Okay, so we talked about William Sharp before, a very influential um, researcher as far as portfolio performance. And um, in 1992, the study of mutual fund performance shows 91.5% of variation in return can be explained by the fund's asset allocation to bills, bonds, and stocks. So what we're saying here is how you build a portfolio, the allocation was going to explain the variation in return. A later study showed that uh, above 90% of the variation of return could be explained uh, by the fund's allocation to a broader range of asset classes. Again, just looking at asset allocation, asset class, it's the performance of different portfolios. So if we look at those coefficients, you know, if we see the portfolio style, if it's a treasury bill portfolio, small capitalization stocks, medium capitalization stocks, or large cap stocks, high PE, medium PE, low PE, um, we see that if we look at the regression coefficient that the um, we could you know calculate this return data to see 
how the style of these different funds, uh, the allocation of it, uh, having it, its effect on a return, you know, and it can be measured by R, squ R squared, which could show the confidence in the overall calculations. All right. So if we look at the Fidelity Magellan, so we can look at the cumulative residuals and uh, from the style analysis versus the security market line as um, a benchmark. And we can see that as long as this black line is beating the benchmark, it's outperforming uh, its benchmark of return. And we can, you know, average uh, tracking error throughout the month. We can see uh, if we're tracking errors uh, of these calculations by various mutual funds. Uh, Morningstar has a risk-adjusted risk rating. So Morning, Morningstar is a rating agency, mostly for bonds, that can give you these uh, risk-adjusted performances, and that translates to stars. You know, it's a five-star fund. So Morningstar not only evaluates bonds, they also evaluate a lot of mutual fund portfolios and puts it in a star ranking. So it's going to be the higher the star ranking, the better the fund is in its performance compared to its peers in the ratings group. And this could be looked at in this overall charter category of the Sharpe ratio in, uh, versus the, the RAR. Okay, so what are some problems with the perfor uh, performance measures? So we assume um, one thing is that the assumption is the, fund, the funds are going to maintain a con constant level of risk. But risk is changing every day. So when you stop and measure performance and you measure risk, you measure alpha, you measure beta, that's a snapshot of that day at that time. So this is problematic for you know, funds who are going to have a large asset allocation in many different areas because it's going to change more dynamically, more quickly. So in a large universe of funds, you might have abnormal uh, performance uh, each period by simply by chance. Um, so this survivorship basis, when I talk about this upward basis, uh, an average of fund performance due to failure to account for uh, failed funds over you know, a similar period of time. Okay, so let's talk about market timing and uh, asset allocation adjustments. But first, let's just talk about, you know, this asset allocation scheme. So, you know, once you've translated the needs uh, into your portfolio objectives, you can construct a portfolio designed to achieve the goals. You know, depending, you know, some portfolios, the goal is income, some is growth, some is um, aggressive growth, um, so but before buying any of these investments to meet these goals, you have to develop an asset allocation scheme where market timing could be could fit into that scheme of that asset allocation. So asset allocation is going to involve dividing your portfolio into various asset classes. And it could be, you know, stocks and bonds, foreign securities, short term securities, uh, some tangible assets like gold or real estate. So the asset allocation and diversification are going to be related to the different ideas of how you want to build and maintain your portfolio. So the asset allocation uh, focuses on an investment in various asset classes, which we're going to talk about a little few slides uh, after this. So spreading your wealth across these different types of assets does help to diversify your portfolio, but beyond that, you can diversify within an asset class by selecting individual securities that are not too highly correlated. So, for example, by allocating your assets between stocks and bonds, you're going to reap some diversification benefits. Um, and the market timing would be basically if bonds are going to be outperforming, you want to move more of your money in, in bonds. But if in some cases, maybe stocks seem to be outperforming, so you sell your bond allocations and move it more into stocks. And that would be kind of timing the market between just stocks and bonds. So the, you know, the benefit within the stock portfolio, is selecting stocks um, that are non-correlated, not moved together, so that the portfolio itself is well diversified and can withstand you know, large stock market shifts. So the same could be said of bonds as well. Um, so the security selection is something that we're going to have to, you can work in within the market timing to try to make an asset allocation that's going to reflect changes in the, in the overall market. Um, so keep in mind that asset allocation is based on the idea that 
a portfolio return depends more on the vision of investments in, into an asset class um, or asset classes than on actual investments when e within each class. So studies have shown that as much as 90% of our portfolio's return come from the uh, asset allocation and 10% can be attributed to the actual security selection. Um, so therefore, researchers have found that asset allocations have a much greater impact on reducing the total risk than does the selections, uh, trying to select the best assets inside the asset allocation category. So the market timing really isn't so much about trying to um, select the best stocks in your portfolio. It's more like trying to put together a better forecast of what areas of allocation should be increased and what should be decreased. And it relies heavily on forecast to, to make this market timing pay off. And it would be considered more of an aggressive tactic in portfolio management. And so you could look at, here would be no market timing with a constant beta. So we can measure the slope at 0.6. Uh, market timing with increasing beta, meaning um, the increasing stocks with increasing risk, the market timing, we get a more increasing slope. Um, with, if we look at uh, two betas together, uh, we can, the slope would be um, uh, beta B plus beta C. And we have to also remember this one line here is the market return minus the risk-free rate would be here. So then this would measure the non-diversifiable risk, taking away the risk-free rate. Uh, and the, the steeper the slope, the more risk there is. So, um, and of course, you know, the rate of return, we're looking return over, you know, rates of return over time, and we always want them to be higher. Okay, so if we're looking at performance of bills, equities, so bills would be like treasury bills, equities or stocks, and the perfect timer, meaning that you're moving your allocation in and out between them, we could see that um, the difference between the terminal values uh, can be quite significant in the, three, in the three categories as you're moving forward. Uh, performance att att attribution um, procedures, so decomposing the overall performance into components. So we're trying to determine specific portfolio choices. So broad asset allocation among different types of securities, uh, industry weighted in equity portfolio, security choice timing. So these are all different things that can contribute to the performance of uh, a portfolio performance. So of course we have, um, you know, how are we gonna put the specific portfolio together? That broad asset allocation, meaning that we're going to take, um, we're going to break the portfolio up into, you know, six different allocation groups: stocks, bonds, equity, real estate, gold, um, to get more of an allocation. So that's going to factor in the performance. Remember, the more diversified you get, the more allocation mixes you put together, the the less variation in return because you're just kind of placing all bets everywhere. Industry weighted in an equity portfolio, looking to, to take a portfolio and weighted between particular industries. Um, security selection or choice in the portfolio is going to be a, you know, sometimes <clears throat> if you have a really skilled or talented manager and you can find those winning companies, that security selection can make that security choice can make a big difference in the overall return of those portfolios. And then we have the market timing or the timing of the buying and selling of different stocks. These are all going to contribute to the performance, of course, of the portfolios. So the benchmark portfolio is kind of comprises of these three indexes given here. That um, so the returns represent unmanaged portfolios. So we have the benchmarks of the equi equity, which is going to be S and P 500, bonds, which is going to be this Lehman Brothers index, and cash, which is going to be a money market. So if these are the the, the bookmarked weight and the return each month, then we can kind of look at what is the overall manager's return versus this this um, standardized portfolio benchmark weight. So this can give us, um, represent return for unmanaged fixed benchmark weights versus um, adjustable weights that a standard portfolio can um, manipulate based on timing of the market. 
So again, this is just a way to measure, okay, here's the baseline. If we kept this bookmarked um, allocation of these sources, equity, bonds, and cash, does your mutual fund manager who has more ability to manipulate between the allocation of bonds, stocks, and cash, are they outperforming? So again, it's going to measure the excess returns because in portfolio management, it's all about did your portfolio or mutual fund that you constructed, is it outperforming the benchmarks and what is the excess return or excess loss versus benchmarks or versus benchmarks allocation? which is basically saying you're trying to compare how your fund's performance did to the overall market because these comparisons are very important in advertisements, in analyzing, in promoting your mutual fund, and in the prospective review that's sent out to investors of the fund. Um, so here's another example of the, you know, some actual weights in the market, the benchmarks weights, the excessive you know, weight. So we're going much lower on fixed income but higher uh, on the equity and cash and we can look at the change and the overall uh, how did this contribute to the return of the asset allocation so again just another application of this idea um, so sector selection within the equity markets so we can you know if we're looking at these are all different sectors which can contain stocks within the sector and their um, the, you know, the percentage in the portfolio um, and then the active, you know, the active weight, the sector return, and then did we outperform or underperform, you know, the baselines. Okay. And then again, this highlighting the, you know, total excess return of the portfolio over the benchmark. All right. So that is chapter 18, active management um, investment and portfolio analysis, analysis of investment performance. So what we're really trying to look at here is when you do put a portfolio together, and this chapter is from the point of view of a mutual fund manager, not from the point of view of your personal uh, stock portfolio. So this is really looking at different mathematical measures that can help quantify your, uh, if you're a mutual fund manager, your the mutual fund you're managing you can be able to compare it to the benchmarks of not just other competitors, but the actual market returns themselves. So sometimes, um, since very few mutual funds are identical, it's, it's not always constructive to say, um, compare them to each other. But it is very constructive to compare performance, excessive return uh, to the overall some market standards. So that's what this chapter is basically trying to build these constructs of how we can do risk adjusted performance measurements uh, using uh, um, examples, you know, the Jensen's alpha trainers measure sharp ratio, information ratio. And again, uh, what we're trying to show here is how our stocks our, our, our group of stocks in a portfolio are going to compare against the benchmarks and specifically analyzing um, the 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 non the diversifiable risks in the portfolio. Okay, so let's move over here, and we're going to look at this. Let's look at a spreadsheet that has some of the math in it. So let me pull up a spreadsheet here. Okay, so here this is the um, what we had just talked about, and we can look at the benchmarks of what we have in equities. And in, in bonds and in cash. Okay, so if you see in the legend here, we have date, enter data, va uh, value calculated, and comments. So here we can set a benchmark up 60% SP, 30% uh, aggregate index, and 10% cash uh, or money market. So it represents equities, which are stocks, bonds, and cash. Now, if we enter in the return, these are the actual returns on these indexes. So here are the indexes, here are the actual returns, and then we could calculate by simply multiplying the weight times the return and finding the sum of those returns. Um, we get the um, return on um, this performance attribution. 
So if we have a managed portfolio down here, so we're going to manage. So this is this is basically the baseline, which we had talked about before. So very easy to calculate. Uh, we have these are fixed percentages for this baseline. We put in the actual returns for the either the quarter or the year, and we can calculate the weighted average of that um, portfolio. So now if we have a managed portfolio, so I'm a manager and I'm going to say, you know what, I picked the 70% equities, it's only 7% bonds and 23% cash. That would be my market timing. Here are my actual returns on my portfolios. So again, just by multiplying um, C by D, I get my percentage return. And if I add these three together, I get my total weighted return of 5.96%. So if I take my weighted return of my managed portfolio and I minus the, the, the benchmark, I see my excess is 2% higher than what um, the benchmark is. So basically this uh, portfolio here is just, here is the baseline of a well-diversified uh, asset allocation as a standard. So was, did your mutual fund manager, if this is your mutual fund, did, did he or she make better decisions on the portfolio weights and did that return excess return over the basically benchmark average? Okay. So then if we move uh, oh, down here, we have again, here's the, the managed portfolio we see from above. So we got the managed portfolio and then the benchmark. So we can see uh, by simply taking the um, B minus the C column, we get the, the percentile difference. So 70% minus 60%, uh, let me just format these as percentages. Since this is a percent, it makes more sense. 70 minus 60, 10, seven minus 30 minus 23. 23 minus 10, 13. So this is the chain excess weight. So the change over the benchmark. Uh, now, if we have our return, this you see the index return here is from above. Here's our index returns, which is just the fact of these three indexes. So if we look our index return, we can figure out the contribution amount for each of these. And that gives the, the contribution of the asset allocation. So this is how the change of this different mix. Now, if we're looking at bonds to equity, the performance, here's our portfolio performance of bonds and equity over the index performance. So here's the excess of performance. And again, we're just subtracting the portfolio from the index and we get our excess. So we did perform better on equities, but worse on our bonds. But because our portfolio weight was more heavy in equity than in bonds, we have an excess, we have an excess contribution uh, based on a better selection of asset allocation or market timing. Okay, so that's just a little math on you know some of the components in the chapter that we talked about. And again, just to belay any fears, you're not going to be expected to know memorize these formulas or calculate these formulas on it on the on an exam uh, at the end of the course. Uh, you're these are simply just to kind of show you that, you know, we do have measure, mathematical measurements and comparisons between mutual fund managers' portfolios they put together compared to the market or the index portfolios for comparison. So investors can know, did my mutual fund manager make smart choices to actually beat the market or did they lose out to the market? And most times, sadly, the index portfolios or benchmarks outperform the mutual fund managers. So that's on the whole, but there's always a select group uh, or, f or a select number of mutual fund managers that are very talented and can routinely beat the, the, mar the, the markets. One problem though is that these, these managers will typically attract a huge amount of capital and the more capital you have to invest, the harder it is to beat the um, indexes and a averages. So what happens to a lot of these funds is they close them out to new investors. So if there's a good fund you're in and, and it starts overperforming our excess contribution, excess returns due to the management, they're going to have to close that fund off pretty quickly or lose its edge or effectiveness in managing a moderate size amount of equity because the, you know, some of these funds, you know, can get to be close to a trillion dollars. And how do you manage that? 
effectively you're not as nimble because you're just too big so just something else to think about okay so i hope you enjoyed uh, just chapter 18 review and presentation and i look for forward to talking to you during the next chapter thank you and take care